So our next speaker is Tianchi Chen. So Tianchi is actually the author of uh, MXNet, uh, which is a very broadly used uh, machine learning framework which has been selected by Amazon for deep learning and used in AWS. Uh, Tianchi is a PhD uh, at the University of Washington. He's our only PhD in the lineup. He is also the only talk which, is, uh, talk, sorry, which is 15 minutes, but there is no connection between the two. What happened actually is that we really wanted to have Tianchi actually come and give a talk about MXNet. We learned about that possibility very late in the process. As you know, we have a very packed schedule. We start earlier than other workshops and, and later. So the 15 minutes is just an expression of us really wanting to have actually Tianchi uh, speak at the, at the workshop. So hi everyone, my name is Tianchi Chen. Um, today I'm gonna talk about some works that we did with MXNet and other things that's related to deep learning. It's a collaboration with the folks at University of Washington and some, some folks at, at AWS. So uh, to begin with, uh, I'm a machine learning folk and uh, one of the exciting areas nowadays is that for machine learning folks who talk to really hardware folks, specifically I talk to Luis and Thierry who are here and uh, system folks in UW as well as some, some folks in AWS. And uh, um, we created a MaxNet, which is a deep learning framework that uh, adopted by AWS. One of the major features about MaxNet is that we support two types of programming paradigm, in a sense that in nowadays you want maximum flexibility. Usually you want an uh, imperial program that allows you to dynamically create something, uh, play it in Python, and do whatever you want. On the other hand, if you want maximum efficiencies, you want to be able to declare your computation beforehand. and uh, build that and reuse that over time. So in MXNet, we think that we want to adopt something like MDOS law to try to optimize the bottleneck part using the declare programming while allow user to gain maximum flexibilities on the part that they can be flexible with. So today I'm going to mainly talk about what our recent effort on bridging MXNet to the hardware. So, uh, and I think this talk also applies to other frameworks as well. So the things we developed it, is not only adopted by MXNet, it's also used in other deep learning frameworks. So to begin with, mo almost all the deep learning frameworks kind of support two, time, two kind of uh, hardware, CPUs and GPUs, because NVIDIA is so great and, uh, and uh, it uh, brings the beginning of the deep learning evolution. However, there are more and more hardware available and uh, the gap between the framework and hardware are becoming larger and larger. In a sense that we want to be able to support things like mobile phones, uh, AMD GPUs, Raspberry Pi, FPGAs, or the custom customized hardware. And it's very hard for framework designers to support each of them in a sense that uh, you have to write customized kernels and all the operations and uh, try to build different frameworks on top of each of your hardware. So how do we solve that problem? In MXNet, we have uh, quite a few core developing members and we want to be as efficient as possible. So our solution, uh, by discussing that over time, we come up with the conclusion that we need intermediate representations in, a in between so that we can try to build common representations that we can optimize for uh, that allows us to bridge between the software and hardware. So if you think about different systems, what kind of intermediate representation that you can use uh, compiling to a compiling systems? Um, normally, if you think about uh, different systems, usually those computations are typically expressed by computational graphs where you have those nodes representing the uh, data, data points and edges representing the data, data flow dependencies between them. This is actually a quite natural expressions of computations and that is one of the representations that most of frameworks use to express their computations. In MaxNet, we adopt an uh, 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 intermediate layer called NMVM, which essentially uses the computational graph as a higher level IR. This kind of high level IR is very useful in a sense that you can do many in interesting tricks on top of it. For example, you can do automatic differentiations, memory optimization, operator fusion, and other things. I will just quickly mention two things that we did, which are quite interesting. The first thing we did is that we can do quite, quite smart memory optimization during training phase. The idea is that normally if you want to do back propagation or, or like gradient calculations in a neural network, you will get a gradient graph and normally your memory complexity will be linear to the number of layers because you have to checkpoint the intermediate result in order to do your backpropagation. That will bottleneck your neural net, number of neural networks that you can, you can put with. For example, in a Titanx GPU, normally you can only put 200 layer ResNet because uh, that is what uh, 12 gigs, what Titanx offers to you. Of course, you can play smart solutions like you know, swapping between CPU and GPU and other system tricks to solve a problem. It doesn't solve the complexity problem. 
Um, by using NVM smart graph transformation, what we can do is that we can have a different graph that computes the same gradient, except that it will try to smartly drop some of the intermediate representation, uh, intermediate result, and recompute them um, during the intermediate phase. By doing this, we can get a square root memory complexity, and that allows you to train 1,000 layer of ResNet on a Titanx GPU, which only costs four gigs of GPU RAM. Another interesting thing we can do is that we can do graph transformation that allows you to directly take a pre-trained graph, for example, full precision, and try to transform to another format that's more suitable to do inference. For example, uh, if you want, when you do inference, you might want to convert from a 32-bit floating point to 8-bit floating point. You also want to do a data layout retuning so that it makes the kernel efficient. So having our own graph is great. That gives us a high-level description that allows us to describe the computation, transform it to, the, to get the good workload that we have, and we still have a problem of how we can get those execution graphs and lower them into the hard wheels. And that gap is still large, in a sense that for each of those operations that represent in a tensor computations, there are still too many things that you can choose from. For example, you need to choose from different precisions. If you want to do low bit, the data layout matters. You might want to fuse some of them together. Uh, if you want to do hardware, you might want to prefetch things to a local buffer so locality matters. If you want to do GPUs, you need to do smart threading patterns that make, make good collaborations with each other. So in order to bridge that gap, we will need even something below the high-level computation graphs that allows you to take benefit of high-level high optimization while still being able to be more specific to lower these things to, to, the, to the specific hardware. So if you think about what is the wish list that I might have as a framework builder for low-level IR, we want to be compact and expressive in a sense we want to be able to represent all the computations we have. We want to be able to take explicit control over memory layout and all the possible options that might affect the performance. We want to be able to take explicit control of data locality and other issues. And one of the interesting things is that we want to be able to support tensorization in a sense that if you think about traditional IR like LLVM, they are vectorized in a sense that you can express vectorized command very easily. If you think about accelerators, usually those computational units are no longer vectors. They are, they are matrix multiplication and convolution. So you really want to be able to tensorize as a, as a basic primitive in the IR. And finally, you want to be able to support arbitrary fixing point and floating point, and we have a lot of discussions on that today. So we have an we have on, ongoing work called TVM, which is a low-level IR that we have that, that reflects the idea we have in here. So, um, as a nutshell, TVM is an uh, index-based tensor description language that allows you to describe the computation by, by describing what, in, how do you compute individual elements. So basically, you provide a shape of a tensor and a, and, a, and a data flow description on how you compute each element. This kind of description is actually highly flexible in a sense that you can, you can describe almost all the computation workloads in the, in the deep learning in a single primitive, with one exception. So, we still need to add more support to recurrent so that we can support RNs and the persistent RNs in a, in a compact format. So by having these two primitives, we can have a high-level description language that kind of high-level IR that kind of allows us to describe all those tensor computations. And we can add transformation rules and schedules that allows us to specify the things like locality patterns, layout specification, and the parallelization patterns we have. Our probe test support lowering to multiple backends, including OpenCL, Metro GPU, which is Apple's mobile GPUs and CUDA, as well as LVM, which allows us to support most of the CPU devices. Um, we're also working together with the hardware, including Louis and Thierry here, to support more accelerating hardwares like FPGA and TPUs. Specifically, uh, Thierry here is prototyping FPGA based GM accelerator, which is quite like a TPU. The idea is that we, don't, we, we are not emphasizing that we can build a, uh, the best hardware out there. It's, the only, it's only a proof of concept in a sense that we want to make it easy to build an infrastructure that allows us to lower to new hardware so that if you design your new hardware, you no longer have to design the software pipeline above it. You can just, just add a new backend to, to TVM and the entire software, back, uh, software pipeline will be there out for you. Um, one of the interesting things as a, as a hardware, uh, as an as a embedded designer is that uh, we bring a feature called remote execution to TVM in a sense that um, we, can, we can deploy a TVM runtime on the devices like mobile phones, FPGAs, and, and put, this, put a compiler or server on, put a compiler on a server backend so that you can do quick explorations, generating kernels, send the data over, over, the, over, the, over to the device using TVM RPC and, and get the data back, 
in an entire script yeah, so that your design experience or verification experience is as same as if you are, you are programming on a single server. So, so this is cool, and by putting, I think one of the most exciting things is that by putting this high-level IR framework that allows you to do high-level transformations, tensor computation, memory optimization, together with this low-level IR that allows you to do specific lowering to a specific hardware, we can have an end-to-end -end stack that allows you to plug in your new hardwares and allows more front-end framework to take benefit of all the different hardwares that might be out there. And with that, I will be uh, more than happy to answer your questions. There are several links here. Uh, TVM is going to be open source in the summer. And uh, another thing is that if you're interested in deep learning assistance, we have a deep learning system course, which is kind of a un unique, the first thing that, that's ever offered that teaches you all the concepts that some of the things that we I talk about here today. So um, thanks very much. Shortest talk and perfectly on time. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, actually, I have one question yes. looking at your slides. So it gave me the feeling that what you're designing is a little bit like a machine learning compiler for accelerators to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it's both an ambitious and a very interesting goal. What I'm wondering is how do you capture the properties of the hardware you're going to compile, optimize for in your framework? That's a very good question. So the question is that how do we capture the property hardware in the compiled framework? I think there are two points here. The first point is that we want to build enough primitives. For example, you want to support tensorization so that you can express what the hardware can do in the IR. Another thing is about after you have those primitives, how do you, how do you build automated tools so that you can automate this lowering process? Uh, most of our current focus is on the first one so that we want to get most of the primitives there to get the, to get the optimization. And we are working on the second part, which is the automatic lowering part. And I think that's definitely an interesting thing. And that's one reason why we open source the, why we will be open source the entire pipeline, so that everyone can start to play with it and try to build their own backend pack pipeline as well as optimization pipeline out there. Okay, thank you. For, is there another question? Oh. Yes. So have you looked at um, execution of uh, various graphs across multiple execution units in parallel? Yes, so the question is that have we looked at uh, execu parallel executions over multiple graphs? The answer is yes. So the, this is more like a more system level in a sense that you want to be able to automatically schedule the possible parallelizable components by analyzing the graphs. In MX then we have a very cool scheduling engine that allows you to directly do that actually on the fly. So it not only takes care of data flow dependencies, it also takes care of other things like networking dependencies and other things. That's one reason why MaxNet can scale to uh, quite scalably to multiple GPUs in the distributed setting. I think you did a good job of distinguishing MXNet from TensorFlow's interface, mm -hmm. but I was a little less clear on how XLA is different from your intermediate representation. Could you talk a little bit how those are different? Okay, so the question is how is XLA different from the intermediate representation? So, what I would say is XLA is more like a high-level graph description language, so that uh, it, uh, it is still in the tensor <laughs> level. And uh, so it's, I, I would put XLA in analog with NMVM. And, uh, and I think, uh, an, so TVM is something more lower, in a sense that it's more close to hardware, and it allows you to express all those specific layout and, uh, and scheduling in the language, as opposed to hide that from the computation graph. How do you see using, well, I, I should say, extending something like Halide that kind of has yes. scheduling and yes. you know abstraction already built in? So, how do you see that relating against this? So, we had, we had, so the question is that how does this relate to Halide, right? So, or, or, or similar DSLs. So, we are definitely inspired by Halide in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, actually, some of the some of the schedules I viewed are directly related to what Halide support. And I think one of the one of the key things is that we have currently mainly focus on deep learning workloads. So we want to bake in new primitives like recurrence. And uh, we, we, are, we are mainly focused on accelerations and uh, GPUs, so there are new things that you want to support. For example, uh, corporate threading between GPUs and uh, the tensorization operations or on, the, on, the, on the TPUs and other things. So I think they, they will be in very similar spirit, except that we are 
specifically targeting deep learning workloads, and we want to do a good job in there. Okay. Is there any other question? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.